Well, good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, January the 24th, and I am so glad that you've tuned in for our Bible class today. We're in the book of Proverbs, and we are so glad, or I am so glad, that you have joined me for this Bible study. If you've got your Old Testaments, you'll want to turn to Proverbs chapter 23. We left off at verse 26 last week, Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. While you're turning there, let me remind you that we are going to continue this online format through the month of February, but the elders announced last Sunday uh, that we the plan is to uh, once again uh, restore our Wednesday evening Bible classes and our Sunday evening Bible classes beginning in, in the month of March. And so hopefully the rest of this month and then next month, and we'll be back together. And we are so prayerful that this will be the last time that we have to go to a purely online format. Of course, when we do have those uh, Bible classes, when we restart in person, I hope that many of you will join uh, join us. If you absolutely cannot, uh, we want you to know, though, that they will still be live streamed, and you'll be able to watch it live, or you can pick it up later. Uh, on our YouTube channel, so that will continue to be available. Okay, with that said, let's take a look here at Proverbs chapter 23. We begin in verse 26, and very quickly, let me just put it in context for you. Beginning in chapter 22, verse 27, uh, all the way through chapter 24 and verse 22, we have what uh, most scholars call 30 sayings. And we are in the middle of that. In fact, with verse 26, we pick up with saying 17. Let's look at it, verses 26 through 28. Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit, and an adulterous woman is a narrow well. Surely she lurks as a robber and increases the faithlessness among men. Uh, This is some counsel that we've seen more than once. In fact, most of these things are repeated because they're really, really important. And this is one of those really, really important things as this man of great wisdom talks to his son, tries to prepare his son for success in life. One of the things that he says over and over again is said right here, and that is, Stay away from loose women. Stay away from them. He says, a harlot is a deep well. An adulterous woman uh, is a narrow well. A harlot is a deep pit. An adulterous woman is a narrow well. Surely she lurks as a robber. Uh, They Prostitution is destructive to a community. That's why... Most communities have laws against prostitution. Uh, It can be very destructive to a community. And he is exhorting his son, listen, think, think carefully, think deeply. Do not go down down that road. That road may look tempting, enticing, Uh, But don't go down that road. It is going to destroy you if you do. Now look at verses 29 through 35. Uh, This poem, we I mentioned it, I referred to it. I don't think we looked at it real close. Excuse me. I don't think we looked at it real close, but we I I referenced it at least. Uh, in some uh, other moments that we've come up uh, apart, uh, come across in the book of Proverbs when it comes to the recreational use of drugs and alcohol. This poem right here, verses 29 through 35, is just, it's a, it's a masterpiece. Maybe I even said that earlier. If I did, I'll say it again. It really is a small masterpiece. It just, in very vivid terms, uh, basically says in in memorable ways that the recreational use of drugs and alcohol will not bless your life. That's the point that it's trying to make. The recreational use of drugs and alcohol uh, is destructive to you. Let's just read the poem. Uh, Not even a lot of comment really is needed to be made on it. It says it all. Who has woe? 
who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaining, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, those who linger long over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. And you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like the one who lies down at the top of the mast. You know, carelessness and recklessness is the idea there. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I wake? I will seek another drink. So again, it's a very, very vivid picture of the destructiveness of the recreational use of drugs and alcohol. Uh, You know, there's other passages certainly that we could tie into this. One that I've jotted down in the margin of my Bible here is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 7 and 8. Uh, Feel free to turn over there with me if you want. If not, I'll read it for you. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 7 and 8. Uh, There, when God is indicting the people of Israel, uh, He's talking about their corruption from, you know, top to bottom. Leaders to the lowliest follower. And He says uh, in verse 7, And these also reel with wine and stagger from strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. Uh, They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. Uh, Again, just showing the drunkenness in its full ugliness and its full tragedy. You know, of course, you live in the same world that I live in. We see the commercials. It doesn't show the ugliness of it. It doesn't show the tragedies of it. It shows how it sparkles and it shows, you know, how enticing it is and it shows how sophisticated people uh, you know, that's what sophisticated people do. That's what popular people do. Uh, that's where, f- f- that's where you'll find fun and fellowship and companionship. And it's all lies. It's all lies. Going down that road is destructive. It will not bless your life. Okay. Now on to chapter 24. Uh, That was, by the way, verses 29 through 35 was saying number 18 out of the 30. Now here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 24, we have saying number 19 of this section. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for for their minds devise violence and their lips talk trouble. Uh, This is another one we've seen over and over again. Be careful with who you associate with. Don't be tempted to hang out with, with people like evil people. Um, they, you know, you should come to hate evil. Um, just because it's evil. Don't envy evil. Despise evil. Evil is not something that should be envied. It's something that should be despised. You know, Why would it be envied? Well, again, evil people, violent people, people that devise evil schemes can look like they're, you know, having the greatest time of all in life. You know, the, um, the other night at home while Leila was working one night, I turned on the television. I wanted to find out I like documentaries and I found this one. Um, I think it was called Operation Odessa or something like that. It was about uh, an undercover operation, law enforcement operation, FBI, DEA, um, you know, 
a, a, a joint joint organization operation against um, that really kind of was, uh, if, if I remember right, it was um, early 90s. And um, it all centered around, and they're interviewing these three guys. Uh, one was from Russia, and one was from Cuba, and one was an American. And they did had different things, but what brought them together, they, you know, they had their hands in um, in everything, prostitution, cocaine, on on huge levels, and um, they were, you know, held hands with the Medellin cartel uh, that you know we've all probably heard of, and and as as the the documentary kind of set things up. It was, you know, it was showing their lifestyle. I'll take five Ferraris. I'll take five Lamborghinis. I'll take all of these women. I'll take that airplane. I'll take it. It was uh, a life of, of no restraints. And as they showed uh, pictures, and uh, frankly, it was pretty graphic. Some of the pictures, of this documentary, it's um, it's it's not a documentary you'd want to you know show your kiddos. Uh, frankly, it is the the seediest, um, the basest part of humanity. Uh, but you could see how people would be caught up in that. And so the whole operation was trying to, um, um, you know, bring them down. Uh, but it just reminded me of how evil people, and wow, they were evil. They'd kill you at the drop of a hat if you crossed them. Uh, you know, there, there was no other way they got respect, you know. And so, uh, so you see how people could get sucked into that life, and you and you see people get sucked into that life all the time. He's saying, listen, don't get sucked into that kind of life. That kind of life is evil. It is sheer evil. And don't for two seconds envy that. Uh, look at verse 3 now. Saying 20. Saying number 20. Verses 3 and 4 here. By wisdom a house is built. By understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Okay. So, by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it's established, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all kinds of precious treasures, pleasant riches. Uh, so, is are, are the riches here literal or are they metaphorical? You know, uh, maybe both is, met, is meant here. Uh, you know, it's probably not just talking about physical things. You know, we, we looked over when we were in chapter 23, uh, verse 4 and verse 5 was all about don't be consumed with trying to get rich. Don't be consumed with that. And so uh, it, it probably is something bigger. The riches here is bigger than just trying to get rich, you know, in terms of physical riches. It's probably as much metaphorical as anything. The primary focus probably should be metaphorical. And, and really, it seems to be saying then, if that's true, that through wisdom and understanding and knowledge, um, those are going to be the ingredients that create a harmonious, loving family. And it's going to, uh, with a harmonious, loving family, there's going to be a sense of security. There is going to be a sense of stability there. And there is nothing greater no treasure greater than that. No treasure more precious than that. And so the importance of wisdom and understanding and knowledge in building a house that is just full of all these wonderful things like harmony and peace and security and stability. Okay, verses 5 and 6 saying number 21. A wise man is strong and a man of knowledge increases power for by wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counsels, counselors there is victory. Okay, 
Let's start with that first line there in verse 5. A wise man uh, is strong, and a man of knowledge increases power. There are some questions about the, in, uh, the translation of that first line in Hebrew, a wise man is strong. At least that's what it says in the New American Standard. Uh, maybe the idea is, uh, and, and really from context, this seems to be the idea that a wise man excels a strong man, not a wise man is strong. Now, uh, but it could mean, uh, and that, I mean, literally, that a wise man is strong, uh, probably, though, is more speaking along the sense of it, it is strength that excels raw force. Wisdom excels raw force. Because it goes on to say, and a man of knowledge increases power, for by wise guidance you will wage war in abundance of counselors. There is victory." Uh, when dealing with enemies and adver- adversaries, he's saying, uh, don't rely on raw force. Intelligence is better. Careful strategy is better. Now, obviously, this is addressing people in high office. Um, uh, engage life, though, the principle would be for all of us, listen, engage life with discernment. Uh, not with brute force. Engage it with discernment. And you're going to get further with discernment and wisdom than with raw power and force. Okay, look at verse 7. This is saying number 22. Wisdom is too exalted for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. Now, the idea of he does not open his mouth in the gate is along the lines of what it's saying is, uh, let, his, let his mouth stay shut at the gate. Now, remember in terms of a, some background information here what the gate was all about in, ancient, in the ancient world. The city gate was a very important place in the community. It was really the administrative center. And so it would be at the gate that contracts would be negotiated and entered into. It was at the gate that grievances would be brought and the council of elders would sit there and, and they would uh, adjudicate these cases that were brought before them. And so the gate was a significant place. And so the idea here, let his mouth stay shut at the gate. Let whose mouth stay shut at the gate? Let the fool's mouth stay shut at the gate. Matters discussed at the gate are just simply too important to waste time listening to someone who is morally inept. Uh, and so, uh, the, again, the principle is don't listen to fools. Don't listen to fools. If you know that someone is a moral rebel and their life is, you know, a disaster, and, you know, ironically, a lot of times those are the people who want to give you counsel in life, and they think that they know everything in life, and they know nothing in life. Uh, when that happens, uh, let it go in this ear right here. And let it come out that ear right there. Uh, don't listen to him. Uh, don't listen to him at all. Uh, look at verse 8, 8 and 9. This is saying number, you guessed it, 23. One who plans to do evil, men will call a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. Uh, the idea here, one who plans to do evil, men will call a schemer. Uh, those who are scheming and conniving and manipulating and unprincipled and who go about their business in life, um, you know, looking out for number one and trying to gain an advantage and they're not beyond uh, a little deception or a lot of deception. Uh, uh, these people... If you're that kind of person, you will get a bad reputation. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long for a conniver, a schemer, to get a bad reputation and to completely lose their name. The scoffer is an abomination to men. Uh, Listen, he's saying, son... Guard your name and reputation carefully. The loss of a good name is not a small penalty. 
the loss of a good name is a devastating effect on you because uh, it, it's not easily to regain that. And so be very careful. Don't be a schemer in life. You treat people as you want to be treated. You are a person of principle and integrity. And that's the kind of people that are respected. And that's the kind of people uh, that others want to do business with. Someone that is a person of virtue and integrity. Okay, verse 10. That would be saying number 24. If you are slack in the day of distress, your strength is limited. If you are slack in the day of distress. What is the day of distress? Well, that would be the time in life, and it can happen at any moment, when a particular challenge rears its head uh, and you may face a great challenge. A challenge can be anything. Life is full of challenges. You know, you can just be kind of cruising along in life and a crisis rears its head. Uh, that's what a day of distress is. And if you are slack in the day of distress, when a crisis comes and, 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 and you falter in the face of that, then uh, it is going to be a, a detriment to you. Don't, basically the counsel is this, don't falter in the day of crisis. When you're faced with crises, deal with them. Summon the strength to deal with them. Don't run. Uh, don't fold. Don't capitulate. You know, don't knuckle under. Uh, when there is a crisis, when there is a challenge that needs to be dealt with, deal with it, is what he's saying. Okay, verse 11 and 12, this is saying number 25. Deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know who it is who keeps your soul, and he will not render to man, and will he not render to man according to his work? Okay, deliver those who are being taken away to death. Who are these? Who are these? Well, some people suggest that it's talking, it's kind of almost being used metaphorically, that it's talking about people who are morally blind and they're kind of stumbling and staggering to their death. Uh, but I, I, most scholars don't think that is the likely uh, intent of the writer here. Most people think it's pretty straightforward. And it's talking about those who... Uh, it's talking about the importance of standing up for uh, those who are wrongly convicted or condemned. Uh, it is emphasizing a commitment to justice. This is a principle that we've seen over and over again. We will continue to see it in Proverbs as well. Uh, that, you know, don't ignore injustice. And, you know, when we talk about justice again, we're talking about, and we're going to see this a little bit later on, uh, true justice does not favor anybody. True justice favors truth. You know, what concerns me today is the word justice is thrown around a lot. And I'm concerned, frankly, that sometimes that word is being abused and it's being uh, perverted. Um, because I think there's a lot of people who are crying for justice, but uh, they, they are looking for revenge. And um, they're, they're demanding something without knowing all of the facts. True justice always is committed to the truth and it doesn't make rash judgments. It takes the time to gather facts. And when that is done, when the facts are all out there, if someone is on the receiving end of injustice, we need to step up and step in 
and have the courage to say, that's not right. That is not right, and, uh, and we need to take a stand. If we don't take a stand, and that's what this seems to really be about, if we don't take a stand where there is true, real, authentic injustice ha- taking place, where we don't, where that's, no, uh, where, where we see true injustice and we don't take a stand, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, stand before God. And, uh, that's what he's talking about there, uh, in verse 12. Uh, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? In my translation, the he there is capitalized. It's a reference to the divine debt to God. And at the end of it, and will he not render to man according to his work? Capital H, he. Uh, God is watching us and we better not be indifferent where true justice, injustices are taking place. Okay, look at verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14 is saying number 26, my son eat honey for it is good. Yes, the honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is thus for your soul. If you find it, then there will be a future and your hope will not cut off. Uh, he associates here uh, wisdom with delightful pleasures. Eat honey for it is good and it is good. I don't know about you. I, 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 uh, I use honey pretty often. I like to, I like to get Greek yogurt and I like to put some walnuts in it and, and put some honey on it. I learned that when I was in Greece. Apparently that's the way the Greeks primarily eat it. And it was like a culinary epiphany for me when I discovered that. And so, uh, oh, it's just great that honey and walnuts and yogurt and, and, and I'll eat oatmeal and, Instead of putting some kind of sweet, uh, you know, uh, sugar on it, um, I will sweeten it with some honey. I love honey. Um, my son, eat honey. It's good. The honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. And so he's associating wisdom with that. Um, wisdom is so wonderful because it is, it is the route to fulfilling dreams. You know, wisdom's the route to a lot of things. We've already seen that, but one is to fulfill your dreams. Because look at it. At, in verse 14, know that wisdom is like honey, is thus for your soul. It is wonderful. If you find it, then there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. So you have dreams, you have great dreams. The, sh- the, the straightest route to the fulfillment of those dreams is wisdom. Embrace wisdom. And man, have we seen a lot of emphasis on pursuing wisdom with the most in, in the most intense way that we can, that can possibly be described. Uh, okay. I think we've got time for one more. We're about at the 29 minute mark, but let's take saying number 27. It's in verse 15 and 16. Do not lie in wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not destroy his resting place, for a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. But the wicked stumble in time of calamity. This is an interesting one, I think. Uh, it's warning the evildoer basically to leave the righteous person alone. Uh, righteous people are, are resilient. When you think about them, well, they should be. They put their hope in God. They know that God is in control. Um, they embrace God's work ethic. They, uh, they never stop working hard. Uh, they're people of principle. They're people of integrity. So yeah, they're going to be, uh, you know, when they're knocked down, they're going to be getting up over and over and over. They're just resilient. And, and so that's what this is emphasizing here. Uh, the resilience of the good of, of, of righteous people, uh, will triumph. Now, again, this is a proverb. And keep in mind, proverbs aren't ironclad guarantees. We all know righteous people throughout history who have been destroyed. Uh, but, uh, more often than not, um, the resilience that, that righteous people have, uh, will, lead them to success. 
Okay. Well, we got down to verse 17 where we'll pick up next week. It's time to end. And so we'll pick it up with saying number 28 next week, next Sunday. Thank you for tuning in. We're on, we're on perfect track to finish Proverbs 31 chapters. We're almost in the end of chapter 24. Uh, we are almost, uh, we are right on track to finish the book of Proverbs at the end of the quarter, which is at the end of the month of February. And so thank you for tuning in again. I've enjoyed the study. I hope that you've gotten something out of it too. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see you soon. Until then, take care and God bless.